So this is a uh, video about Nussbaum's article, Non-Relative Virtues, which you were to read for um, Thursday, November 20th. And I'm going to make a, a few uh, of videos on this so that they're not all, uh, there's not a really long one. Um, the first thing I want to point out is something that she uh, disagrees with. <coughs> this is what she's not uh, uh, arguing herself, and that is that because she wants to give a non-relative view, she says one could look at virtue ethics as incorporating both objectivist and relativist aspects. Um, the, obje the objectivist part being that uh, the whole idea of what moral action is being based on what a virtuous person would do. So thinking back to the previous uh, video on Hearst House's article where she says, or where I've, I've, I've pointed out in the chart that what right action uh, could be is what the virtuous person would do, which can be based on what the virtues are, uh, which then is based on what leads to flourishing or what is a good bet for flourishing. And that whole idea could be objectivist. We could say that is what morality is about. So to some extent, um, the, this would be an objectivist view. But there could be some relativist aspects to it, meaning there may not be any um, uh, universally valid way of thinking about flourishing for human beings. There may not be a single way to conceive of eudaimonia, which would then mean there wouldn't be a, a single set of virtues that would lead to that single uh, way of, of understanding human flourishing. Um, and this, this is, uh, I think, well, this is how I've tried to, to make sense of it. And just noticing that this is not actually Nussbaum's view. Um, the whole structure of the moral theory, the whole structure of what morality means and how we determine what right action is could be considered objective. But you might think that each one of these parts, because eudaimonia is, is um, something that could be relative to a culture or a society, um, if that's the case and the virtues based on it are going to be relative and the virtuous person and et cetera, et cetera, it's all going to go down the line like that. And um, what Nussbaum is, is trying to say is that we can actually, well, I, I, as I'll show in another slide, I think she's trying to say that we can think of flourishing in a, in a much more objective way, which means we can come up with a more objective set of virtues and a virtuous person. And she starts off by asking about whether Aristotle's view is relativist. And um, even though it looks like some of his virtues, especially megalosuchia that she talks about, um, could be considered more relative to ancient Greek culture than, than perhaps uh, modern North American cultures, um, she claims that even though it might look like what he's trying to do is is relativist to some extent. He was not actually trying to be relativist, and maybe he just failed to be to be universal when he was attempting to be. Um, and we can see this pretty clearly, I think, in in Aristotle's own text that that in um, section two of of book one he says you know, actually I think this is also in in section one of of book one that we're looking for the the final end of all human action that, um, that if we can all human action aims at some end in relationship to what that action is is there some goal or end that we can say all human action can be subsumed under if we can subsume each act action under some particular goal and that goal under some more general goal can we put it all under a single goal and he's not talking there about actions of people in certain societies he's talking about human action um, similarly when he talks about the function argument the characteristic activity that humans have in order to decide what um, what would be the the goal of of uh, human action what would it look like and what would our um, uh, excellence in acting in a human way to reach flourishing look like as virtue, he has to talk about what uh, the human characteristic activity is, which he claims is guiding our action by reason. And again, this is a, a human function. This is not um, specific to any particular society. Um, and also, 
she claims that if you look at Aristotle's list of virtues, and she gives his full list on page um, 262, I only gave you in class a partial list, but she gives all the virtues that he gives in his text. Um, she claims that you can you can think about each one of these as as talking about some area or sphere of human experience that is universal that everyone has to to make some sort of choices in. So courage has to do with fear of of harm or damage to yourself, including death, and um, greatness of soul has to do with attitudes with respect to your own worth, um, which she claims or is suggesting here could be a, a universal sphere of human experience even if we don't necessarily agree with the way that Aristotle defined greatness of soul that we need to have some kind of attitude with respect to our own worth might be something more universal um, in addition we've got uh, generosity has to do with management of one's personal property could be a universal area of human experience, could be something that we all have to, to think about, although she ultimately ends up questioning this one um, as, you know, do we absolutely have to have private property to be a human being? Uh, and if not, then it's not really a universal sphere of human experience. So she claims that even, you know, even if it might look like some of these virtues are specifically Greek, um, perhaps, you know, the idea of courage being focused on death in battle, for example, the, the general areas that he's talking about um, as areas of human life that we could act virtuously or unvirtuously in, she claims are, are could be viewed as more universal, though ultimately she's not going to include all of them on her own list that she gives of universal spheres of human experience. Um, she uh, herself then tries to give a, a objectivist view of um, uh, virtue ethics, which is what I will look at in the next video.